I don't think the conservation of angular momentum is going to surprise anybody because um, angular momentum is so similar to linear momentum and the conservation of linear momentum, or as I like to write it, PI is PF, is so fundamental to physics. This is true for every interaction that's ever happened between anything ever and, as far as we know, ever will. This is true if the net external force is zero. Then momentum will be concern conserved for the system for no external forces. So <coughs> I'm just going to very quickly derive the fact that uh, angular momentum is also conserved and it's as strong of a um, as strong of a statement. So we can first note that torque is change in angular momentum with respect to time. And then we just, I guess, need to write, I mean, this isn't the calculus definition, but it's pretty solid. We need to write that delta L, therefore, I mean, that's the definition. It's L final minus the initial L. And um, I guess that's equal to torque times time. So that's how you change angular momentum. You get a torque acting over some time. So we can then write that uh, if, if net torque external equals zero, then, here we go, here we go, L final is L initial. Or maybe you want to switch it around when you're working with it, but now you've got yourself another conservation law, that angular momentum for a system will be conserved. So we can write a, uh, a really quick example of that I'd like you to consider, as we did in class, that, um, <clears throat> I, I love this example, there's a, um, there's a turntable, and the turntable's got a little spindle on it, and there's a record up top. I'll put the record in, I don't know, how about black, because it's vinyl, right? And the record is sitting up here at rest. Let's see if we can draw more record groove looking things on here, all right. And the record, <laughs> the record has less mass than the turntable, but it has an identical radius. You can define this as the radius of the system. And um, I guess the record, I'm going to say, just for the sake of argument, that the mass of the record is one-fifth the mass of the turntable. So then we can look at the moments of inertia of the two things. We know that the moment of inertia of the record <clears throat> is equal to, well, let's see. The moment of inertia of the record is going to be one half, because it's a cylinder, a solid cylinder, one half the mass of the record times the radius score, and the moment of inertia of the turntable will be one half the mass of the turntable times the radius score, and those are the same uh, radii. So in fact, then we can write that the moment of inertia of the turntable is five times the moment of inertia of the record. All right, moment of inertia of the turntable is five times bigger because it has five times more mass, but they have identical um, <clears throat> geometric characteristics. So the question that I might ask about this problem is, <clears throat> if the turntable is initially spinning, now this is how, um, this is, what are those things called? Jukeboxes. This is how jukebox turntables work. You've got a turntable that's spinning, and the record, there may even be a stack of records up here, is at rest. And then uh, the needle comes off the previous record, and this record is uh, by some complicated mechanism dropped right onto the platter. Now that's a collision, and you can call, tell me what type of collision it is, actually. It's, uh, of course, a completely inelastic collision. So I want to know how fast the system is spinning after the collision. All right, so let's take this up here a little bit, and let's wonder how fast this system is spinning after the collision. And the reason that I say after is not so that we can look at how fast it's spinning after the motors had a chance to get everything back up to speed, but because there's been a collision, 
it won't be, the record won't be going quite as fast as the turntable was going because of the conservation of angular momentum. So let's write that L naught equals L final, and we could think about the things that initially have angular momentum. Initially, we've got the angular momentum of the turntable, and angular momentum is I times omega, so we're going to have the moment of inertia of the turntable times the initial angular sorry, the initial angular velocity, I times omega, and angular momentum on the other side afterwards will be the moment of inertia of the turntable times omega final plus the moment of inertia of the record times omega final. We can make some substitutions here. We know the moment of inertia of the turntable. Sorry, can I stick with a capital T? Holy cow, sorry, I'm being so confusing. I'm gonna stick with a capital T and that, that's five times the moment of inertia of the record. So I'm going to write 5i record times omega naught is 5i record times omega final plus i record times omega final. Cancel some things. This is 6 omega final, and this is 5 omega naught. So if we're looking for omega final, it's 5 sixths of omega naught. Yeah, okay, so it slowed down, but just a little bit. And again, by the ratio of the masses. So I hope nobody's particularly surprised at that. There are two more things I wanna say before I go on. First of all, I had this wonderful question in sixth hour. And the kid says, he says, <clears throat> what if there's friction? What if this collision is not instantaneous? And in fact, I argue, I mean, I put an exclamation point because it's such a great question. I'll put two question marks because it is still a question. What if there's friction so that as they collide, the record very gradually gets up to speed and the turntable very gradually gives up some of its angular momentum to the record? And I would argue that in fact, <laughs> we can turn this around and say, what if there's no friction? Mm-hmm. Are you thinking about that? What if there's none? If there's no friction, then the record will never collide with the turntable because they won't come to a common velocity. It's as if they never interacted, if there's no friction at all. So in fact, friction, kinetic friction, is the way that the collision takes place. Kinetic friction causes the collision. Let's go blue for this one. No, let's go back to red. The force of kinetic friction causes collision. And I'll put collision in quotes, but the force of kinetic friction causes the collision and enables them to come to a common velocity. And that is interesting because the force of kinetic friction is actually doing work. It's causing the energy of the system to leave the system as heat. And that's consistent with the fact that K final is not K initial for an inelastic collision. We already argue that this is not an elastic collision, it's an inelastic collision. And I want to point out that we can actually calculate, if we know the coefficient of friction and we know the normal force on the record, we can calculate how much work friction has actually done and that should be exactly equal to the loss in kinetic energy of the system when the collision happens. Ding!